Welcome to the Rocky Mountain MS Center's webinar series, Maximizing Lifelong Brain Health in MS. Today's topic is how to stay in the workforce and understand how to protect yourself in the event that you no longer can do so. This presentation features Tom Stewart, a physician assistant and disability attorney. Tom Stewart leads the Rocky Mountain MS Center Legal Clinic and directs legal services. Tom studied as an undergraduate at the University of Notre Dame and studied law at Boston College Law School. After clicking for the New Jersey Supreme Court, he attended Physician Assistant School at the University of Colorado, where he received a master's degree. Tom has been involved in the medical and legal care of MS patients for more than a decade. This webinar is scheduled for one hour. The first 50 minutes will be the presentation. We are going to cover a lot of information today, so if you miss something on a slide, if you want to repeat it, pause, replay, we will be archiving this webinar on www.mscenter.org so that you can replay it at any time. We'll reserve approximately 10 minutes at the end to answer questions from the audience. You can submit questions at any time during the hour by typing them into the chat window on your screen. We will answer as many questions as time allows. And with that, I will turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Kelsey. So again, the purpose of this talk is to prepare people with MS who are working for the possibility that they may someday become disabled. Being disabled or disability, at least I will, as I will be using it most of the time today, refers specifically to the inability to work unless otherwise described as with the discussion about the ADA that um, we'll get to later. But before beginning, I want to make a few preliminary points. First, it's increasingly clear that with good medical care, many people with MS will maintain normal or near normal function for their entire lives. But it's sobering to know that approximately one in four 20-year-olds will lose the ability to work prior to retirement age and that includes those without any diagnosis whatsoever. So it is just a good idea for everyone to know how to protect themselves should they lose the ability to work and to take whatever steps make sense to increase that protection. Second, I don't mean to imply that people with MS should spend too much time understanding the laws or planning for the possibility of disability. There are just a few laws and practical points that people with MS should know about to protect themselves. And I will try to boil these down to what I perceive as the most basic lesson that I have learned over the last decade working with people who have become disabled. I've frequently encountered people who have said, if only I had known. And my goal today is to um, hear that complaint less often by communicating some of the biggest potential pitfalls in this webinar. Although many of my points are technical, it's not important for you to understand all of this right away. It will be enough to remember broad issues and refer back to this website or some other resource when work workplace troubles begin. And if you don't have time or energy to listen to this in its entirety, that's fine. Please feel free to sign off and return to the uh, recording of this, which, as Kelsey said, will be posted shortly after um, the presentation at the website www.mscenter.org. Thus, it is critical to think just a little about these relatively few potential mistakes, even as people with MS should focus their energy on staying productive in the workforce and having a long career. So my hope is that nothing in this talk is either discouraging or overwhelming. Finally, people with chronic progressive diseases like MS, there are at least two distinct issues that usually occur sequentially or that may occur sequentially. The first issue is how to stay in the workforce when relatively minor limitations first begin. The second issue for people with MS to understand is their financial safety net in the event that they lose the ability to do their job or even the ability to work full time at all. I sometimes think of the various protections as an alphabet soup of laws, usually in the following order. FMLA, ADA, ERISA, and SSDI, referring to respectively the Family Medical Leave Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, and, the Social, and Social Security Disability. 
These four federal laws are the major source of protections for workers with multiple sclerosis and suggest a number of strategies that workers with MS can use to protect themselves. It's important to know that there are also important state laws related to the federal laws that I'm going to describe, but these are beyond the scope of what I will be talking about today. I'll try to point out situations where state laws play an important role. First, I'll talk about the FMLA. Consider when, and maybe the first consideration, well, one of, and, and how that helps with the problems of, problems of absenteeism. Because one of the problems faced by some people with multiple sclerosis who are working is the need for frequent absences. The increased need for absences among people with MS is due to numerous factors, including exacerbations, sometimes requiring weeks of absences, treatment, such as monthly infusions, the need for physical therapy, which is usually one or more visits per week, office visits a few times per year, and simply the number of bad days, especially maybe when it's warm, when symptoms are usually severe. Such a high number of absences, according to most vocational experts, is a problem because missing just one day of work per month would not be tolerated by many employers. Fortunately, the uh, federal law passed in 1993, the Fed, uh, Family Medical Leave Act, protects some people with MS from losing their jobs due to high absenteeism. Accordingly, people with MS and their caregivers need to understand the basic protections afforded by the FMLA. In a nutshell, the FMLA provides eligible employees unpaid protected leave to care for themselves and close family members. Such employees may take up to 12 work weeks of leave in a 12-month period for one of four reasons. The most relevant two reasons for purposes of this talk are, this talk are a serious health condition that makes the employee unable to perform the essential functions of his or her job, or to care for a spouse, son, daughter, or parent who has a serious health condition, including incapacity. Although employers do not have to pay their employees during FMLA leave, an employee may substitute accrued sick leave for this period of time. In addition, federal law provides tax incentives to employers to voluntarily offer paid family medical leave. So check with your employer to see if um, it is voluntarily decided to offer paid family medical leave. It's also impo important to note that employers do have to continue health benefits for their employees while they're off um, on the FMLA, though they may require the employees to pay their share of the premiums during the leave. One aspect of FMLA is certification. An, employee, sorry, an employer may require that an employee submit a certification to support the need for FMLA, a form to be filled out by the employee's health care provider. The certification will indicate that an employee or family member has a serious health condition requiring dairy, um, days or periods of, of absences. Although most employers use standard forms available on the Department of Labor's website, no specific form is necessary to provide certification. What is necessary is that the certification contain the following, the health care provider's contact information, the date that the serious health condition began, the likely duration of that condition, and if the employee is a patient, whether the employee is unable to work and the likely frequency and duration of this um, inability, and a family member is the patient, whether the family member needs care, and an estimate of the frequency and duration of the leave required to care for the family member. Most neurologists and their staff are familiar with this form and generally willing to assist with this process. An employee who has missed work pursuant to the FMLA must be allowed to continue the same job or an equivalent job when he returns to work. Again, these protections are very powerful and allow people with MS to address the problem that absenteeism presents. In addition, the FMLA can sometimes serve as a pause when an employee first learns that his or her employer has noticed performance problems. This can be an early indication that someone is at risk of being let go or fired, which may be related to MS symptoms. This can be a good time for someone with MS to discuss the problem with their physician or other health care provider and seek time off through the FMLA for additional symptom management and evaluation. 
such as neuropsychological testing or functional testing, functional capacities evaluation, and to consider options as whether workplace accommodations are needed and even whether it is time to apply for disability benefits. The major limitation for patients seeking these protections is that the FMLA applies only to covered employees. In other words, I'm sorry, uh, covered uh, employers. Um, so it's critical for people to know whether their current employer is subject to the provisions of the FMLA. The FMLA applies to all public agencies, including the federal government, state government, public schools and agencies of the state government, regardless of the number of employees. However, the FMLA does not apply to all private employers. Specifically, the FMLA applies only to large employers, those with 50 or more employees within 75 miles of the employee's work site. Because the number of employees an employer um, has is so critical to determining, to determining whether an employee is covered, a technical exception is worth mentioning. In some circumstances, separate businesses may be considered to be a single employer for purposes of the FMLA. Factors to be considered in, the, in determining if separate businesses are an integrated employer include common management, interrelation between operations, centralized control of labor relations, and the degree of common ownership or financial control. Employers covered by the FMLA must provide notice to their employees regarding the FM, FMLA. This can be through a poster or through an employee handbook. A less significant limitation to the FMLA is that it does not apply to all employees. Thus, it is critical for someone with MS to know whether they are covered employees. To be protected by the FMLA, not only do they need to have a covered employer, the employee also has to have worked a total of 1,250 hours during the 12 months immediately before the date the leave is to start. In other words, the employee must have worked approximately 24 hours per week in the 12-month period. The 12 months do not have to be consecutive, however. If there has been a break in employment for over seven years, then the prior months do not count. There's another narrow exception for key employees, those among the highest 10% of earners at a company. An employer can uh, deny restoration of an employee after leave if it will cause substantial and grievous economic injury to the operations of the employer. This usually applies when permanent replacement of the employee is unavoidable. And then if an employee believes that FMLA rights have been violated, there are two options. You can choose either to file a complaint with the Secretary of Labor or to, pri or to file a private lawsuit um, under the FMLA. So um, now's a good time to mention uh, some of the state laws in this area very briefly. Um, some, some states have enacted legislation to create state paid family leave insurance programs, which provide cash benefits to eligible workers in some instances. At the time of this writing, California, Rhode Island, New Jersey currently operate family medical leave insurance programs that offer four to 10 weeks of benefits to eligible workers. Three other states in the District of Columbia have enacted FLA pro FLI programs, family uh, leave insurance programs, but they are not yet fully implemented. These programs are variously funded um, uh, by employee contributions, employer contributions, or both. Other states are considering such programs, including Colorado. Be sure to check whether your state provides paid family or sick leave. So my first two concrete suggestions are related. First, understand the significant protections afforded by the FMLA, and second, find out whether your employer is a covered employer for purposes of the FMLA. And finally, this is, not, um, this is obviously not a practical suggestion for all, but given the choice between a few different employers, people with a chronic disease like MS, this should, should give considerable weight um, to whether one of the employers is subject to the FMLA and consider the important benefits that would be available through that law. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk um, about, an, um, I would say, the other major law that's important for 
um, people who are interested in staying in the workforce, and that's the American with Dis Americans with Disabilities Act. And so just to cover some of the basics, like the FMLA, the ADA is federal law and therefore applies in all states. The part of the law that I will be talking about today is enforced by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, which protects virtually all disabled employees as long as their employer has at least 15 employees. In the context of the ADA, but not for other purposes such as Social Security, a person who is, who is disabled has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. This impairment must be substantial in that the impairment significantly limits um, hearing, seeing, speaking, breathing, performing manual tasks, walking, caring for, some, for oneself, learning, or working. In most cases, somebody with MS will have a disability and um, will be an employee entitled to protection. So, critically, the American with Disability Act requires that covered employees make reasonable accommodations um, to the known physical or mental limitations of an otherwise qualified individual with a disability. And surprisingly, the words reasonable accommodation are not defined um, within the ADA. Rather, a few examples are provided, such as um, physical changes to render facilities accessible, restructuring jobs, offering part-time or modified work schedules, Schedules offering to reassign, modify existing equipment, or acquiring new equipment, and provide, providing interpreters. An excellent source for identifying potential useful op, um, accommodations can be found at the website of the Job Accommodation Network, JAN. JAN is organized in multiple useful ways, including by diseases such as multiple sclerosis. It's further organized by particular symptoms and limitations. For example, for the many people with MS who experience fatigue, Jan offers the following possible suggestions cut and pasted from their website. And you can see these on the slide. I won't read them all. Um, but uh, each, and then each of these um, uh, is further described. Uh, so if I look at the, the suggestion here for a flexible schedule, um, the website elaborates further if you click on the link. Employees who experience um, certain limitations, this quote, um, uh, may need a flexible schedule in order to work optimally during hours of increased attentiveness. Flexible schedules can also be used to have a period of mental rest in order to refocus or re reorient into his or her work. Examples of a flexible schedule would be adjusting starting and ending times of the workday, combining regularly scheduled breaks to create one extended break, or dividing large breaks into smaller segments and allowing work to be completed during hours when the employee is most mentally alert. To begin the process of seeking reasonable accommodations, the person with a disability must inform the employer that, due to a medical condition, there is a need for an adjustment, accommodation, or change at work. No, no legalese, for example, I hereby request an accommodation, is necessary. It only needs to be articulated in plain English. A request for an accommodation should trigger, quote, an interactive process, which refers to the information gathering necessary to evaluate the request for an accommodation. As, but as described by the EEOC, the interactive process is intended to be a flexible approach that centers on the communication between an employer and the individual requesting reasonable accommodation. It may, and often does, involve obtaining relevant information from a supervisor and an individual's health care provider. The person who will decide whether to grant or deny reasonable accommodation will engage in a discussion with the employee with a disability as well as others to collect information about whether there are accommodations that can be made that will eliminate any barriers to, to employment. So the limitations, there's, there's only one statutory limit on whether um, a particular accommodation is reasonable. reasonable. An employer need not accommodate an employee with a disability if doing so would cause the employer, quote, undue hardship. And undue hardship, according to the EEOC, refers to significant difficulty or expense and focuses on the resources and circumstances of the particular employer in relation to the cost or difficulty of providing a specific accommodation. 
Undue hardship refers not only to financial difficulty, but to reasonable accommodations that are unduly extensive, substantial, substantial, disruptive, or those that would fundamentally alter the nature of the operation or business. Whether an accommodation would create an undue burden for an employer is a highly uh, fact-specific question. Another consideration that may, um, may restrict request for an accommodation is that, the, is that an employee with or without an accommodation must be able to perform the essential functions of the position. For example, if an employee cannot meet production goals of a, of a position, even with an accommodation, he or she may not be protected by the ADA. There are fa three factors to consider when, evalu to, when evaluating a function as essential or marginal. The relationship of the functions to the other job, whether reassigning the functions will affect other employees, and the significance of the function and the conditions under which it's being performed. An example may help. Assume that someone is employed operating a machine. The job, their job description, among other thing, things, states that the job includes painting the machine twice a month using a ladder. Many people with MS may have balance problems, and this aspect of the job may be difficult and dangerous. However, Painting the machine may not be an essential function because it is not critical to the execution of the job, which is to operate the machine. Accordingly, a request by the machine operator to have the painting function assigned to another worker might be granted as a reasonable accommodation. If you have requested an accommodation that's been disapproved by your lawyer, another step, uh, the next step may be, if you feel like you've really been wrong, to call the EE the EEOC, um, you must file a charge of discrimination with the EEOC before filing a job discrimination lawsuit against your employer. There are time limits for filing a charge, generally 180 days from the date of the alleged violation. Again, there are important state laws here. Um, you should look into state law, especially if, especially if your employer has fewer than 15 employees. Um, all states have uh, civil rights uh, divisions, and you should contact your state civil rights division for additional information. Now I'm going to be talking about um, a, a different subject. I'm going to be talking about what happens when, um, you know, the, in the event that uh, somebody with MS has to leave the workforce because their limitations are so severe that they can no longer do their job. There are two main sources of protection, financial protection in this situation. Private disability benefits obtained through an employer and Social Security disability benefits. So I'm going to first talk about ERISA. The Employee Retirement Income Security Act is a federal law. It was passed in 1974. It governs most employer-offered private disability policies. However, it does not apply to government employers or churches. Um, my first suggestion is to obtain private disability benefits through your employer if you can. And this may seem obvious, but I have encountered um, many situations where people with MS have chosen not to um, participate in an um, employer-offered private disability plan. People who have been diagnosed with a potentially disabling disease like MS are not generally able to buy private disability insurance through a broker in the marketplace. However, many employers offer disability insurance as part of a, as part of a broad compensation package. For people with MS, this kind of pr protection is so valuable that it should be weighed heavily when making employment decisions. This may be your only opportunity to have access to private disability benefits. When compared with disability pro the disability program administered by the government, Social Security, um, private disability, disability benefits provide a larger income stream, a shorter exclusion period, and may be easier to access. Such private um, policies frequently replace 50 or 60 percent of a worker's salary. The next suggestion would be to purchase additional coverage where possible. Sometimes an employer will provide an opportunity to increase uh, coverage for employees who are willing to pay for it. If you can afford the additional coverage, purchasing, is, purchasing it is usually an excellent idea. Um, 
my next suggestion regarding private disability is that you should learn about the exclusion for a pre-existing condition. Most policies provide an exclusion for pre-existing conditions. So if someone has MS before starting uh, a job, it may seem like a pre-existing condition, and it would be. However, pre-existing conditions will generally not prevent claims for disability, disability benefits after the first year of work. But be careful, because time off from work may not be included in this calculation. Thus, if you've um, been employed for 12 months, but were out of work for the Family Medical Leave Act, for example, for one of those months, you may find that you have not been working long enough to qualify for disability benefits. Check with your specific disability insurance policy for additional details on this. Um, this next section is a little bit technical. Understand the difference between own occupation and any occupation policies. Many private disability policies, the best ones, will provide benefits if you become unable to perform the essential functions of your current work. For example, a neurosurgeon may be rendered entirely unfit for his job because of a slight tremor. Although such a neurosurgeon could probably perform other work, it doesn't matter if he or she has an own occupation policy. Some policies are referred to as any occupation policies in contrast, and they will only provide benefits if the claimants or the policyholders can prove that they're unable to do other work as well. Most policies are hybrid policies. Hybrid policies typically provide coverage for those who cannot perform their own occupation for a period of time, for example, 24 months, and then convert to an any occupation policy. Often, <clears throat> this is further defined as any occupation has an inability to earn 60% of your previous earnings, or maybe 50%, it may vary. Understanding these issues will help you choose the best disability coverage and will help you uh, plan if you lose the ability to perform your current work. Most long-term private disability policies require, as a condition for continuing benefits, that you apply for Social Security Disability Insurance benefits. In general, the standard for proving disability for Social Security disability insurance is much higher than it is for private long-term disability policies. So it's possible that you may be found disabled for private disability benefits, but not for purposes of Social Security. However, if you do qualify for both, the monthly benefit you receive from Social Security will generally reduce the amount that you receive from the long-term disability insurer. For example, an employee who earned $80,000 per year might receive in disability $4,000 per month. That's 60% of her former salary. If she's found disabled by the Social Security Administration and her Social Security benefit is $2,000 per month, she will continue to receive $2,000 from her private disability insurer and $2,000 from Social Security. So there's a set aside um, from the private disability policy um, based on Social Security payments. And an award of Social Security will not increase um, generally monthly income. Even so, it's important to get Social Security disability benefits if you qualify for at least two reasons. First, Social Security disability benefits are entitled to Medicare 30 months after their disability onset. For most people, this is a critical benefit, if not in the short run, at least at some point after they've stopped working. Second, a finding of disability will result in a disability freeze. This protects your retirement benefits, not your disability benefits, but which are calculated based on your average earnings. Without such a freeze, disabled people would be at risk for receiving diminished income at retirement age when private disability benefits generally cease. Many long-term disability policies encourage beneficiaries to apply for SSDI benefits using a particular representation company and indicate that this is a free service. Be very wary of this. Most of, these, most of the time, these referrals are to, or often anyway, to non-attorney advocates. You're generally better off hiring an experienced attorney who will represent you. Because of the way Social Security attorneys are paid, hiring an experienced Social Security lawyer is also free to you in most situations. You have a right to choose your own counsel, despite the language used by private disability insurance companies. This 
I'm going to be turning um, to talk more about Social Security Disability Insurance, which is um, by far um, the most important financial safety net for most workers. And that's because most people who become disabled do not have private disability benefits. So the first point is that you should understand whether you're eligible for SSDI benefits. You're eligible for Social Security disability benefits if you have worked long enough, paid Social Security taxes, and importantly, have worked recently enough. To be covered, most middle-aged adults will have had to work five of the last 10 years. This is a particular trap for stay-at-home moms or dads, and I will discuss it more in the next slide. Most people who have worked uh, full or even part-time and paid uh, taxes most of their adult lives will be covered through Social Security for um, disability insurance. Um, understand the consequences for withdrawing from the workforce for personal or family reasons. This is, um, again, about the stay-at-home mom or dad. Most people who have not worked in the five years prior to becoming disabled will not be insured by Social Security, thus will be not entitled, thus they will not be entitled to benefits even if they become severely disabled. This is a potential trap for the stay-at-home, uh, work-in-the-home spouses. Uh, consider a woman who plans to stay home with her young children and then, to, then return to work. If she becomes disabled after staying out of the workforce for five years, she will have lost the ability to file for Social Security disability benefits. Virtually no one thinks of this protect, the protections available through Social Security's disability insurance program when making a decision to withdraw from the workforce and they should. There are a number of solutions to this potential problem. For example, it is possible to maintain eligibility by working part-time. In 2019, earning just um, $5,440 per year will maintain eligibility. And this number is um, inflation adjusted and changes every year, so um, it would have to be looked up in some other year to find out the exact number. If you have MS and can work, consider at least part-time work or to limit your hiatus from the workforce to less than five years so that you may stay insured through Social Security. And this is an, another pitfall that I've seen a few times. Less, it's less common, but understand the risk of transitioning from a private employer to a public employer. Those who work for government agencies and public entities typically pay into something like a Public Employees Retirement Association or PARA instead of Social Security. In general, this is fine. PARA also pays disability benefits when someone becomes disabled. Rarely, however, a significant problem arises where somebody who has paid into Social Security takes a break and returns to work as a public employee, such as a teacher. If someone makes this change and becomes disabled shortly thereafter, he or she may not be insured through either program. PARA, para generally, or other um, uh, uh, replacements for Social Security um, for um, uh, state workers generally requires an employee to work five years before becoming eligible for disability benefits. And an employee wor um, moving from Social Security to PARA may wind up unprotected in certain situations. So if, all, if, if you are insured and if you um, can prove to Social Security standards that you're disabled, that is unable to do any job um, on a full-time, 40-hour-a-week basis, um, you need to be prepared. There's still some challenges. It will take at least a, um, a five-month uh, period of time before you can get your first check because Social Security has a five-month exclusion period. If your claim is favorably, favorably determined, your best case scenario is to receive an income after this five-month exclusion. As a matter of practice, however, because of the way Social Security counts these months and pays benefits, you will not receive your first check for seven months after you stop working. You may need to prepare for this gap, or you will need to prepare for this gap, especially if you do not have other support or private short-term or long-term disability benefits. Social Security standards are very demanding, and many claims, 65% of them, are initially denied. In that case, you may need to request a hearing before an administrative law judge. 
Unfortunately, getting a hearing scheduled generally takes at least an additional year. If this becomes necessarily necessary, you may have to struggle for approximately 18 months without an income. This is one of the many reasons that people to know, need to know that their spouse in particular and their community more generally are often the most important and reliable safety nets of all. Um, make sure that you have a clinical team that will support your disability act, uh, um, application and one that will create a strong medical record for you. Um, in addition to clinical expertise, you will occasionally need advocacy from your clinical team. A successful disability claim will depend on strong medical record and support from this team. Beware, some clinicians, quote, don't do disability paperwork and apparently don't view such paperwork as their responsibility. In a way, this is understandable, um, that they, they want to avoid involvement and the additional time and paperwork involved when patients become disabled, but such a refusal to get involved may have financially ruinous consequences for people with MS. So therefore, people with MS should make sure that their clinical team will support them if this becomes necessary. If you're considering applying for disability benefits, whether Social Security or private disability benefits, the stakes can be enormous. Um, and make, you should make sure that your uh, clinical team is one that would support you through this process. <clears throat> so a determination of disability, whether through Social Security or private disability insurance, will largely depend on your medical record. Please consider the following suggestions. First of all, keep regular appointments with your medical providers. Of course, you need to visit your healthcare team primarily to get your medical conditions treated but you should also keep in mind that you may need regular office visits, preferably for, from an MS specialist, also to support your claim for disability benefits. If you do not seek care for your condition, then the Social Security Administration may interpret that to mean that your condition does not limit you very much and will therefore deny you disability benefits. This is a potential problem for people especially who choose not to use the FDA-approved medications despite the recommendation of a neurologist. This is fundamentally a bad idea, usually for one's health, but failing to see an MS specialist may harm you in unanticipated ways, including limiting your ability to prove disability. There's another potential problem for people who rely heavily on telephone or emails to communicate with their clinicians. Office visit notes, which are among the most important documents for supporting disability claims, are only created when you have an appointment with your provider usually face-to-face -face or possibly through a telehealth visit. Sending emails or calling your provider may be um, practic uh, more practical at times, but such emails may not be available to support your claim, and even if they are, such records may not be afforded as much weight as if they were included in your office visit notes. That said, if you have had important communications with your health care provider through email, try to make sure that the um, substance of these communications are included in the office visit notes when you follow up with your health care provider. Another suggestion would be to follow up on all recommendations made by your health care providers. Again, follow up, following up with your neurologist and his or her recommendations is probably a good idea to stay well and avoid limitations and disability. It's also important to think about how uh, your follow-up, uh, think about your follow-up from another perspective. SSA, as well as private disability companies, may characterize your failure to follow up as non-compliance and use that to deny a disability claim. For example, if you're referred to physical therapy, you should follow this recommendation, again, primarily because you need physical therapy, but also because it may become relevant in a disability claim. If you're unable to go, say, for financial reasons, be sure to explain this to the referring source, usually your neurologist. <clears throat> it's also probably a good idea to ask your neurologist to record the reason for your inability to follow up um, with his or her recommendations. You should see appropriate medical providers. If you have MS, for example, obviously you should see a neurologist. If you have chronic pain, see a pain management physician. For a degener degenerative disc problem, see a spine specialist. Primary care providers are truly invaluable resources, but ideally you should receive care from, from an appropriate specialist for any condition that causes you limitations. As always, you should do so to receive the best care possible, not merely to provide support for a potential disability claim. 
for mental health problems, it's best if you see at least once in a while a psychologist, someone whose credentials include a PsyD or a PhD, or a psychiatrist, a mental health doctor with an MD degree. Therapists, counselors, and social workers can provide excellent treatment, but Social Security will generally give more weight to a description of limitations provided by psychiatrists or psychologists. And then you need to tell your health care provider about all of your symptoms and limitations. Your neurologist cannot include uh, information about your symptoms and limitations unless you, unless you specifically tell her or him about them. If your doctor doesn't write about your limitations, there will be no record of it. If it is, isn't in your medical record, SSA won't know about it other than by your self-report, which will probably be insufficient. Also, you should know the difference between symptoms and limitations. Symptoms describe your experience of having an illness. An example is fatigue. If you experience fatigue, it's important that you mention this symptom to your doctor and that she puts this into your um, office visit note. But this may not be enough. You should also document your limitations. Your limitations are the so what of your symptoms. For example, a limitation related to fatigue may be that you need to take one hour rest or naps in the middle of Day. You should describe such limitations to your health care provider. Similarly, remember that what you tell your doctor may wind up in the medical record. Of course, you cannot, uh, an example would be if you tell your doctor that you went on a skiing vacation with your family, don't forget to point out any relevant um, factors or challenges. For example, point out that you didn't ski if, and needed to be moved from the parking lot to the ski lodge in a wheelchair if those are the facts. You should also create a longitudinal record of your challenges, especially as they relate to your ability to work. Describe your, describing your limitations thoroughly and accurately at every visit is um, possibly the single most important thing you can do to increase the likelihood um, of a favor of a, that your disability claim, if you need to make one, will be favorably determined. In particular, you should describe challenges at work um, that relate to MS, for example, if you find yourself taking rest throughout the day or notice that you're having trouble keeping up with the expected pace, you should note these to your MS care team as soon as you can, even if these problems are still mild or don't yet threaten your ability to work. This kind of longitudinal history or history over time is also <clears throat> important and much more convincing to Social Security um, than limitations that appear suddenly in your record on the eve of a disability claim. So with that, I think I'm done with my presentation. I want to thank you for your time. This talk has been particularly detailed. And as I mentioned, my main hope is that people have simply observed big picture considerations. When more specific information is needed, this webinar will be available at the Rocky Mountain MS Center website, www.mscenter.org. For patients at the Rocky Mountain MS Center, as well as patients who receive care elsewhere, Stay in touch with your clinical team as you begin to notice problems in the workforce. Most are very supportive and may be able to help address symptoms that are interfering with work as well as to document work-related limitations as early as in the process as possible. Finally, the Disability Law Program is here to help, particularly if you're about to leave, workforce, leave the workforce due to a disability or are making an initial application to Social Security. All initial consultations are free, and even in, ca in some cases where we represent you, there would be no charge, depending on the situation. Also, if your um, claim for private disability benefits are denied, do not attempt to appeal on your own. Your first step should be to call us or another law group specialized in these matters. I think I said finally already, but I'll say it again. <laughs> I thought of one point that is so important that I should have included it this morning, I thought of it that I should have included in the substance of my talk. Rather than neglect it, I'll mention it briefly here at the end. <clears throat> Very frequently, about twice a month, I speak with people who were fired from good jobs that offered disability benefits. Often the, the um, employer explains that this is the, due to poor performance. This can be so upsetting to people that it is viewed as an injustice, and that is one possibility. But another possibility is that the employee's symptoms have worsened to the point where they were no longer able to keep up with the demands of their work, even with accommodations. A 
especially with higher level professionals who are proud of their careers, um, uh, this can uh, result with a financially, interfere with a financially protected outcome. It is sometimes easier to blame, uh, quote, bad bosses than to recognize one's own shortcomings. But this mistake can be financially ruinous. For workers with MS who have had strong reviews their entire careers and suddenly finding that their employers are finding fault with their work, consider this to be a red flag. It is possible, although there are other explanations too, that due to MS you've started to lose the ability to work through no fault of your own. Consult your clinicians and consult us. If your symptoms are interfering with your work, the um, correct outcome is to receive disability benefits, not to be fired, and to be impoverished. impoverished. Being fired prior to applying, applying for disability benefits will make it harder for you to receive these benefits. Please get help early once challenges in the workforce appear. I want to acknowledge the many people who have helped make this talk and the disability law, pro the disability law program possible, including the Rocky Mountain MS Center, our wonderful, uh, many wonderful clients, and the uh, um, uh, Rocky Mountain uh, Multiple Sclerosis Center legal clinical staff, Teresa Mitchell, Sarah Darnell, Tori Wampi, and Liz Lechek. Thank you, Tom. Um, if you have questions to submit, please do so now using the chat window on your screen. Um, we had a couple of questions uh -huh. submitted earlier that referenced very specific um, job positions and what reasonable accommodations might be for that. And I'm just going to go ahead and reiterate that um, Job Accommodation Network website is a great one to look at for um, ideas on reasonable accommodations. You can find them at askjan.org. And it's not only um, a website to browse, they actually have a telephone number and very expert people available to help with specific questions about um, reasonable accommodations, which is a highly fact-specific question in any case and difficult to answer in general. Um, so one of the questions we had submitted was questioning, uh, what would you recommend if you were trying to get back into the workforce if somebody's employer um, did not make reasonable accommodations for them, now they're trying to get back into the workforce? So, um, so I don't, I don't think there's, I, I don't see the, the particular challenge, I guess. I mean, if you can go back to work and have an opportunity to do so, of course, you're going to be better off. Everyone's going to be better off. I think maybe the implicit in that question is an uncertainty about whether um, he or she is able to go back to work. And um, I can't really speak generally about private disability benefits because those are contracts and highly individual. Um, but I can tell you about Social Security because it's the law and you can look it up. And, and they do have some very favorable provisions for allowing people to try to return to the workforce. So if the concern is you're not sure that you can make it if you go back into the workforce or that you might lose your benefits while trying and then be in a worse position if you fail, you should be reassured that Social Security um, does provide some pretty good protections in that situation. And it's complicated, but basically somebody can, can do a nine month, can, can, can work for nine months while receiving full benefits and earn as much as they want um, without uh, having their benefits discontinued. And then, you're earning over what Social Security considers to be substantial gainful activity, um, and that's a number that changes every year. Let's say, for the sake of argument, it's $1,200 now. I think it's actually $1,180. But if you begin to make over that, then yes, Social Security will discontinue the benefits. But again, they, you, you, will, you would be able to keep Medicare in that situation, um, and uh, supposedly Social Security would um, uh, expedite your uh, return to receiving benefits. So it's a, Social Security also is a great resource for questions like that. So I would refer um, that person, if, if I understand the question correctly anyway, I would refer the person to call somebody at Social Security. There's a pamphlet available about return, um, return to work and other resources available too. We had another question um, about how is the employee covered for their treatment costs once they're on disability? So again, it's Disability is 
um, uh, is, is vague to me in that setting. Of course, it could be private or um, Social Security. Again, I'm going to not be able to talk too much about the um, private disability benefits. Um, usually, they don't pay health insurance. Um, and uh, Social Security does. One of the major benefits of receiving Social Security is Medicare. Unfortunately, it takes 30 months from the date of disability to get Medicare. And so, um, but once you get Medicare, Medicare will usually cover the medications, again, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, but that creates quite a problem for people that, um, you know, the, the, you know, the time between getting well, stopping work, which is necessary basically to apply for Social Security or to earn very little, and the time Medicare kicks in is two and a half years. And um, the idea is, um, the reason for that gap is the Congress decided that people can just simply pay COBRA benefits for that period of time. And there's a special rule to extend COBRA for from 18 months to 24 months when someone's found disabled through the Social Security Administration. But as we all know, that is not a practical solution given that um, many people's COBRA benefits are about the same as um, their mortgage. So um, it, it's a big problem. Many of the drug companies have excellent patient assistance programs. And um, uh, my experience is people, that's their, um, that many people, for many people, that's get, getting access to the MS drugs while not insured is their biggest concern. And in fact, usually that works out pretty well through the um, patient assistance programs provided by the manufacturers of each of the different medications. Um, in many states that have undergone the, or have um, participated in Medicaid expansion through Obamacare, and that's not all states, it's, it's a lot of states, most states I'm sure, um, for somebody without an income, through while they're waiting, you know, while they're waiting for Social Security, while they're pending hearing, for example, which, as I mentioned, could take 18 months, um, Medicaid is usually available. Um, most people should, who, who are impoverished during this period of time, waiting for a hearing um, for, before Social Security, should visit their county department of social services to see if there are any benefits that they may be um, they may have access to. Um, you know, so ho hopefully that answers, we'll re repeat the question again, it's like how do I access the medications? Uh, how is the employee covered for treatment costs once he or she is on disability? Right. So, so yeah, after 30 months the answer is Medicare. Hopefully somebody has this, I mean, you know, I imagine the, the writer of the question doesn't have a working spouse through, you know, where, where um, spousal insurance benefits are available. But again, the main answer is, I guess, that the um, drug manufacturers will often pay for this, or provide it, rather. And I just wanted to clarify the 30 months after the date of disability is the date of approval of disability benefits, not the onset of disability. Uh, no. It's okay. a good question, though. So, so Social Security has to make two decisions um, about whether somebody is disabled whether they're disabled and when their disability began. When people apply for Social Security, they allege an onset date. So usually, that's the first date that they have to stop working. And again, that's, a, that's rough. You have to make a decision and apply for Social Security knowing that there's a fair chance your claim will be denied. But anyway, that, that, that's an alleged onset date. Now, Social Security, if they find somebody disabled, they also have to um, identify an established onset date which may or, not, may or may not be the same as the alleged onset date. It often is, however. So usually the 30 months doesn't relate to the time, doesn't, no, the 30 months doesn't relate to the time somebody, the time Social Security makes a decision. It relates back to the established onset date also, which is probably the alleged onset date, which is probably the day after somebody stopped working. And I think that is all that we have time for today. Tom, thank you for your time and all of this information. Um, again, just to reiterate, this is available, will be available on our website um, for folks to view. Um, Did we give out phone numbers? Oh, nope. So 
if you would like to reach uh, Tom at the legal clinic for the Rocky Mountain MS Center, you can call 720-301-9708. And again, all the consultations initially are free. Um, and we'll include that number uh, in the description of the webinar as well. Thank you.